Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath once again. I'd like to start today by doing something just a little bit different. In your notes, if you take notes, I want you to write the phrase, we live in a world where, dot, 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 or fill in the blank, we live in a world where, and I want you to fill in the blank. Just take just a moment here. Think about something that uh, might come to mind. We live in a world where something. <laughs> There's a lot to write about and think about here in 2020. Uh, you know, <laughs> coronavirus, certainly <laughs> top of the list, probably. Uh, social unless, unrest, the election, uh, ever-changing feast plans <laughs> certainly has been one. <laughs> Could be anything. Just uh, take a moment and just jot something down. We live in a world where blank. I'll give you just a second to do that. I know 2020 has been an unusual year thus far. Uh, it can be a, a little unsettling. It has been a little bit unsettling. So when you wrote down, we live in a world where blank. What'd you write? <laughs> What'd you write? What came to mind? Uh, well, answers might vary. Uh, I think about, you know, uh, my own answers there. Uh, we live in a world where uh, things are easily disrupted, I think is something that certainly comes to mind uh, over the past six months. We live in a world where uh, there are angry people, we live in a world where there's division. We live in a world where God is not truly known by and large to many. Now, if you're like me, that's probably what came to mind, and probably not too many of us wrote something down. Oh, well, maybe you did, and if you did, good for you. Things like, we live in a world where some people still care about each other. Or we live in a world where we're blessed to have God's written world word. Or we live in a world where we are free to worship and fellowship and peace. So if you wrote that down, good for you. You're, you're better than I am. But you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of things going on. Today, I want to take a look at a world that one of God's servants lived in and the challenges that he faced. And perhaps more importantly, Three lessons and encouragement from Daniel. Three lessons and encouragement from Daniel. When I say Daniel, I don't mean me. <laughs> I mean Daniel as in uh, uh, the fellow that lived in King Nebuchadnezzar's time. Wrote a book of the Bible. So we're going to look at a world that Daniel lived in. And we're going to look at three lessons and encouragement from Daniel today. We'll begin with a little bit of an overview of the book of Daniel. Uh, when we think about Daniel, we think about Daniel in the lion's den. We think about uh, the, the statue, right? King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2. We think about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And of course, those are all big stories, and we'll touch on some of those in today's message. But what about the world that Daniel actually lived in? Those are some stories from his time, his life, from the life of his friends, but what about the world he lived in? The world Daniel lived in was uh, a rapidly changing one, not unlike our world today. Uh, in the early part of Daniel's life, uh, prior to his birth and probably up to the time he was uh, an early teenager perhaps, uh, the world was at a, a world war, basically. A uh, world war at that point in time in that part of the world between the Egyptian Assyrian alliance uh, and the Babylonian their Medes or uh, the Persian what's now what we call Persia or over in the land of India or the region of India today that alliance it was pretty much a world war kind of a battle for control of that region going on. Uh, eventually, the the uh, the Babylonians uh, wound up winning that war, and so it actually brought a relative time of peace. Uh, some of that fallout, though, was that uh, Jerusalem was ca captured, of course, 
And when Daniel was very young, uh, they estimate somewhere maybe between 5 to 15 years old, he was taken back to, uh, to Babylon where he was to be educated as perhaps the bright future of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. They educated him. They had plans for him as a future leader to help uh, in their empire of the world. Uh, Babylonians were uh, relatively uh, easygoing in terms of, of your religious beliefs. They didn't really care too much what you believed as long as you behaved yourself, paid your taxes. <laughs> they, they were fairly easygoing on that. But there were some times when uh, what they believed would certainly contradict with what Daniel knew to be true. And we're going to read about some of those times. He was, in essence, a, a child prodigy for the Babylonian government. They recognized him at a young age as being a bright young lad, and they wanted to make something, make some use of him for their own political motives. Much of his life really would have been lived in comfort and peace, intermixed with some very sore and difficult trials along the way. <laughs> Not unlike our lives today, is it? That's the world he lived in. Some difficult trials here and there, most of the time things were okay, but always, always changing. Again, I think we can probably all identify with that. So let's pick up the story. We'll start at the beginning of Daniel. Daniel 1, verse 1. Again, just to get some context here. You can put a marker here in Daniel. We'll be spending most of our time in the book of Daniel today. Daniel 1, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand. He was a sharp study, right? Quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So they're looking for bright young minds that they could indoctrinate and use for their own advantage in their own government, their own system of life over in Babylon. It says, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He goes on to give, uh, I'll talk about the new names they were given. But here, in essence, we see that these young men are, are given what's the equivalent of a, a full-ride scholarship in the, the University of Babylon, so to speak. They're going to be well-educated, well-taken care of, room and board, all the education that their minds could hold. If you wanted to put a dollar term on it, you're talking about three years of basically a, what was the equivalent of college-level teaching. You know, you might be talking about somewhere between thirty and $300,000 worth of of today's dollars that the Babylonian government was investing in Daniel. No, they were looking to get something out of their invest investment. Now, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily cause a problem, but we do see that some, uh, uh, some contradictions, some controversy comes up pretty soon. Verse 8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. So apparently Daniel was a, a likable enough guy. Uh, the person who was directly in charge of him, his overseer, apparently liked him. They had a good rapport. It says, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. <laughs> and the, the king's eunuch here is saying, do you know what you're doing to me? <laughs> you know, you're putting my life at risk. The king comes, sees you guys looking underfed. He's going to say, hey, how come you're not taking care uh, of these young men? 
So Daniel was in a little bit of a tight spot here, right? On one hand, he had been shown much favor. He had been given tremendous opportunity. Uh, and one way you might look at it and say he sort of owed it to his overlords, as it were, not, not to be a problem. Uh, but yet there was pressure put on him to do the wrong thing, to partake of these things. We don't go into a lot of detail here. We're not told exactly, but it seems probably some unclean food, probably some ritualistic things uh, uh, with the wine being sacrificed and offered to, to uh, idols and things along that line. You know, he was under pressure to conform to the world around him. Daniel was feeling a little bit of resistance at this point. Not outright oppression, but some resistance between his efforts to obey God and what those around him wanted him to do. He had to make a stand and resist the challenge. It was a tight spot, but... No doubt, with God's guidance, he comes up with a solution, potential solution here. Read about that in verse 11. It says, So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And Daniel says to this chief steward, he says, okay, put me to the test. Do you know what Daniel's actually saying here? He's saying, okay, put God to the test. Put God to the test. He put his faith in God. He put total faith that God would see him through this challenge. Now, I think in hindsight, Daniel would probably look back at this and consider this one of the more minor challenges he had in his life. But he put his total faith in God. Daniel lived in a world that challenged his faith in God. How about us? Is our faith ever challenged? I think it's safe to say it is, isn't it? Has the coronavirus challenged your faith on some level? Now, in one way, we might think, no, of course not. I still believe in God more than ever. And I believe that to be true. But what about the things that are manifested in our daily lives? What about things like, oh, the economy is, is really struggling right now. I don't know if I can quite really afford to, to pay my tithes. I might just have to fudge on this a little bit. Or, you know, with kids being out of school, you know, going to the feast, it's just an unsettled time. Uh, the kids are learning from home anyway. You know, we'll, we'll just kind of, you know, stay here and we'll just kind of do maybe a couple things around the house to, to make the feast special, you know, without actually attending. And I understand, of course, there are legitimate reasons some are, are not able to attend. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying, has our faith been challenged? Have so we've gone through this times and seen an opportunity in a place where instead of putting God to the test, we said, no, we're just going to kind of cave and, and go with the flow. Now, Daniel could have said, ah, you know what, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a ham sandwich or two. You know, I just eat, eat what I'm told to eat and not cause any problems. You know, it's never the big things that get us. You think about a house, right? happens occasionally, but very rarely is it a flood or a fire that ruins a house. It's usually more something like mold or mildew, a little bit of water creeping in. You know, it starts with that one little drop of water. For us, it starts with a little bit of compromise. This isn't a sermon on faith per se, but where do we put our trust? Do we put God to the test? <laughs> or do we try to take that test on our own and say, well, I'll just I'll fudge a little bit on some things, rather than saying, no, I'm trusting God to take care of me and supply my need. Daniel 1, verse 15. Daniel 1, verse 15. Said, at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. 
Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. You know, Daniel and friends, they put their faith, their trust totally in God. They put God to the test. God provided what he needed, what they needed in a relatively simple matter. Daniel's faith was that God would take care of him. And notice what it leads to. This is what I really want to emphasize in our first point here. Verse 17, it says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. Daniel and friends put God to the test. And God gave them not only favor, but he gave them understanding. Going back to that phrase, we live in a world where? Now, in Daniel's time, Daniel lived in a world where, dot, 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 (laughs) there was not understanding. There was not understanding of the true God. Now, I started to say where there was not faith, but I don't think that's quite accurate. Those in Babylon had a lot of faith, but their faith was in the wrong thing. Faith was in their false gods or their system or their knowledge or their wisdom. It's not unlike our world today. They, the Babylonians, they weren't putting God to the test. They were putting themselves to the test. They were putting their own understanding, their own knowledge, their own wisdom to the test, and eventually, eventually they failed. Daniel lived in a world where there was a lack of understanding. He lived in a world where there's a lack of understanding. They didn't understand God's laws, for instance, as Daniel did. And while this may have been a little bit of a, a challenge, caused Daniel to be in a tight spot at a time or two, it points to something greater. You and I live in a world where we do not lack understanding, or maybe more simply put, you and I live in a world where we have understanding. We have understanding. We might not know all the answers of exactly what's going to happen, when and where, but we have understanding, overall understanding of biblical prophecy, what God's plan is for mankind. I think that's incredibly encouraging for us. We live in a world where we have understanding. Hold your finger in Daniel here. Let's turn over to Amos for just a moment. Isaiah Joel Amos, just a few chapters away. Amos chapter 3. You know, we live in a world where understanding at large is lacking, but our own understanding is not lacking. Amos 3 Amos, another one of the prophets that God worked through to lead Israel even during the time of uh, their punishment. Now God's explaining things to them. Amos 3 verse 1, it says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now God chose to work strictly with Israel at that point in time. The rest of the world didn't know that. Daniel understood that. It says, Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Now here we read about a coming fall of Israel. Israel was being punished for their sins. But God said, you know what? I'm not going to blindside you. I'm telling you what's coming. You know, for those of you who are parents, you had children. You know, you know what that's like. You know, you set rules in place with your children. You say, if you do this, here's the consequences. You know, and we might not like to hear the consequences coming. I'm breaking the song for a moment. Okay, sorry. Nothing like a live show, folks. (laughs) There was an agreement between God and Israel in that sense. They knew that there were consequences for disobedience. God says, you know, those consequences are coming. 
Much of the world doesn't know and understand that there are consequences that are going to be doled out up to and including at the time of Christ's return. They lack understanding. You and I should be and can be encouraged and grateful that we do have understanding. Our first point then is, you and I live in a world where we can be encouraged by the understanding God gives us. You and I live in a world where we can be encouraged by the understanding that God gives us. Now, God blessed Daniel with this understanding, and that no doubt, no doubt gave him some encouragement, but that didn't make all of Daniel's troubles go away. <laughs> In fact, as far as that goes, things were really just kind of heating up for Daniel. If we go on into chapter 2 here, We'll read a little bit more of uh, how things got to be pretty tight for Daniel. Daniel 2, verse 1 says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. You know, he was losing sleep over these dreams he had. Said, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So he says, okay, you know, I had this crazy dream, and I don't know what it means. Verse 4, the Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic, says, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. So, you know, how many times have, have you done that with a, a friend? Somebody said, I had this crazy dream, and they tell you about it. And they say, well, what do you think that means? And of course, we give our take on what we think it means, you know, and, and that's pretty easy to do. Imagine your friend saying to you, hey, I had this crazy dream. What did it mean? Well, what was the dream? No, no, you tell me. <laughs> you know, and that's basically where Daniel found himself. But there uh, were some more serious consequences if he couldn't answer the question. It says, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. He says, no, it's not the way we're doing it, guys. Uh, you need to tell me what it really means. Verse 7 says, they answered and said, uh, let the kings tell the servant the dream, and we will give his interpretation. So there's a little bit of a kind of back and forth here. Verse 8 says, the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would ga gain time. In other words, you're buying time. It says, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. <laughs> In other words, you, you ain't going to have to worry about anything else. <laughs> it says, there's only one decree for you, for you have agreed to, to speak lying and corrupt words before me till this time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. You know, so he goes uh, through all of this, and, and he says, nope, guys, you either tell me or it's off with your heads. So they're trying to buy time. Uh, uh, verse 10 says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now the king gets upset. He says, For this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So some of the wise men, uh, seems, were killed, and, and Daniel was, you know, further on down on the list for whatever reason. Of course, I believe that God spared him, of course. But the decree goes out. You know, it kind of reminds me of the uh, the old joke. There's a guy who's, you know, on, on death row, and he's gonna he's supposed to be executed. And, of course, tradition is that... Uh, you get one last meal. So the warden comes to him and says, what do you want for your last meal? And the guy says, all I want is a nice bowl of fresh strawberries straight out of the garden. And the warden says, strawberries aren't going to be in season for another eight months. And the guy says, well, that's okay. I'll wait. <laughs> and he's trying to buy a little bit of time here, okay? Magicians are doing the same thing. Daniel got caught up in somebody else's issue, didn't they? Now, who knows if, if the king would have gone directly to Daniel, maybe Daniel would have been revealed the dream, would have answered right there. But, you know, the king started with those closest in his court, 
uh, and the decree goes out. And now all of a sudden, Daniel is caught up in somebody else's problem. You ever feel that way? <laughs> ever feel like you're caught up in somebody else's problems? Maybe somebody else's pandemic? <laughs> We think, hey, you know, we didn't start this. Why are why are we having to deal with it? You know, Daniel was in a tight spot. Here for Daniel and company, it's life or death. Continuing verse 14, it says, Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the decision known to Daniel. No, it's pretty brave of Daniel just to even ask this question. <laughs> I mean, uh, nothing says that he even gets to, to ask a question, but again, it seems that God granted him favor uh, through Ariok here and says, you know, what's a king in a busy, so urgent to kill everybody? You know, what's, what's this all about? So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him the, the time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So, you know, what the other astrologers and magicians asked for, uh, Daniel got. So I think there's another lesson in there, and I think that builds on the faith that he put in God and the faith that Daniel trusted in God. You know, he goes and, and asks for the same thing, really, that everybody else asked for, but he's given favor here because he asked. No doubt it did with humility as well. Said, then Daniel went to his house, made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Here we see a cycle listened, listed that I think we can all identify with. One, we have a problem. Two, we ask for some clarifying questions to try to get some understanding, whether that be clarifying questions to God, whether, you know, it's an issue we're having with, with our health and we ask a question to the doctor or with work and we ask a question to the boss. We ask some clarifying questions. He takes some time to share with others who are directly involved, not blabbing his business, but those who are directly involved here uh, to his closest companions. You know, we might do the same with, with spouse or a trusted co-worker or friend, take the issue to God, we get a, an answer from God, and then we give thanks to God for that answer. Now that all sounds pretty simple, uh, but the trick is that sometimes there's a lot of time that goes by between a couple of those steps, <laughs> particularly about that fourth and fifth step, the one where we ask God for an answer and it's revealed to us. Now that's where the real trick comes in. But in Daniel's case, the answer was given right away. Daniel was given the interpretation of the dream about the statue, and we won't go into all of that right now. It's not the purpose of today's message. But God reveals it to Daniel, who then shares it with Nebuchadnezzar. And notice then what Daniel says in verse 48. Verse 48, or what the outcome is in verse 48. You know, he gives him, gives him the interpretation and the outcome here in verse 48. says, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel went from a almost certain death to a tremendous promotion and his livelihood. Had, you know, physical, financial, material gain. There's a similar story for Daniel's three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or for those of you who like the Veggie Tales version, Rack, Shack, and Benny. And that's over in Daniel 3. Daniel 3, and then we'll just kind of go through that real quickly. Daniel 3, verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar made king an image of, uh, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Uh, cubits, rough measurement, about 18 inches, so 60 cubits I don't know, times a foot and a half. It's about 90 feet tall. That's uh, about as tall as any you know, oak tree that, that grows around these parts. So that's a big old statue. Okay, and you know the story, right? Verse 4 says, The herald cries aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. 
And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning of the fiery, of uh, uh, a burning fiery furnace. So, this statue is set up, and the command is put in place to worship it. This is very clear idolatry. This is the textbook definition of idolatry. This goes well beyond the, uh, what you might say, political pressure that we saw in chapter 1, where Daniel's being encouraged and coerced, uh, but not quite forced to eat unclean things. Uh, here we see people being forced to obey an ungodly law, being forced into idolatry. We live in a world where there are a variety of laws we must obey. Wearing a seatbelt, wearing a mask, <laughs> all these things that, you know, we may agree, we may disagree with, but here they are. Now, they don't contradict God's laws, so we obey them. We also live in a world where there are a lot of laws, civilian laws, that make it legal to do things that God says don't do. Abortion same-sex marriage, etc., you name it. We don't yet live in a world quite like what Daniel did, where there are things that we're forced to do that we know are wrong. We live in a, a world where we're forced to do some things we may not like. We live in a world where some things are allowed that we know are wrong, but we don't yet live in a world where we're forced to do things that we don't like. You know the story here, right? Daniel's friends... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. The furnace is so hot that the guards who are throwing him in can't even do their job. They get burnt up in the fire. Verse 24 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They would answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God directly intervenes to save them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, there, there's some speculation here on exactly what Nebuchadnezzar meant. You know, how would uh, he know what the Son of God uh, look like. Some say, well, if you look into the Chaldean language, he actually says, looks like one of the sons of a god, you know, uh, of a pagan god. Uh, of course, I don't uh, believe that. I believe that this is the one, of course, that became Jesus Christ, that this was the Word, or the Logos, uh, before he was manifested as Jesus Christ there that protected them. But in any case, it's a divine miracle. You know, other men who didn't even get into the fire died. You know the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they go in, the ropes get burnt off of them, but there's no smell of fire on them, and they're just standing there walking around. You know, I can't imagine what it was like for them to be standing in there. You know, first of all, they're probably pretty amazed. Uh, the engineering part of my mind thinks, you know, aside from just uh, surviving the fire, what about the oxygen that's being consumed? How would they even breathe, <laughs> you know? But they're probably standing there, and at some point, they're probably kind of saying, okay. What do we do now? <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're brought out. And in any case, it's a divine miracle. Verse 30, uh, we read, uh, it says, uh, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They are spared the trial and given huge promotions. You know, we live in a world where there is hurt and there's pain. No doubt we may be living in a world and someday we face persecution just as Daniel and friends did. We live where there are unjust laws. We live in a world where there is anger amongst peoples. There's crime, there's anguish, there's despair. But you know, we also live in a world where God provides for his people. We live in a world where God provides for his people. Again, keep your finger here in Daniel and turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'll read a little bit of, take a little time and read here what Christ said. 
about the subject uh, of worrying about our physical needs. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 22. Luke 12, verse 22, it says, Then he said to his disciples, this is Christ speaking, of course, says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? What's God saying here? He says, put me to the test. He said, put me to the test. I'll take care of you. I will take care of you. I'll provide you what you need. Again, I said before, this isn't a sermon on faith, but I think we can see how closely faith and encouragement are tied. Verse 29, he says, Do not seek what you should eat and what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. You know, we understand we have a responsibility to, to work, to save, to budget, to do things like that, to take care of ourselves. But it's saying don't, don't put excessive worry on these kinds of things. You know, do your part, but don't lose sleep over it. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar was losing sleep over things he didn't understand. God says, trust in me and I'll take care of the things you don't understand. Verse 31, it says, but seek for, or, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, we have concerns just like everybody else. We face trials, we have pains, but we also take great comfort in knowing that God does supply our needs. Maybe you've had a, a sore trial, the loss of a job over the Sabbath. You know, it seemed like a, a big issue at the time. You know, and, and where are you today? I've been through that myself. I was out of work, expecting our first child, needed a job, had the job landed and in the bag, ready to start. And then they said, oh, by the way, <laughs> you do have to work every other Saturday for half days. So I can't do that. I said, well... That's the job offer. That's why it's contingent. You know, I got off the phone and I sunk down on the floor and I put my head in my hands and I cried because I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea. About an hour later, I got a phone call from another employer who wanted to interview me. Went out there, interviewed and talked to him early on about the Sabbath, the holy days. And the guy looked at me kind of funny and he said, I couldn't imagine asking you to do something that would compromise your faith. He said, you don't have to worry about that here. Got the job. God provided it. Now, it seemed like a big trial at the time. But, you know, God opened a door. He provided in a way I didn't expect. We probably all have stories like that that we could share. Christ's words in Luke 12 remind us of something critical. You know, we live in a world where we have hope and encouragement through God's promises. We live in a world where we have hope and encouragement through God's promises. Whether that be promises here and now or promises yet to be filled in the kingdom of God. We live in a world where we have hope and encouragement through God's promises. There's one final lesson I think we can learn about encouragement in the first few chapters of Daniel. Have you ever said to yourself, you know, I wish I lived in a world where I didn't know the things I know. <laughs> you know, I wish I could just be ignorant, you know, fat, dumb, and happy, as they say. Most often we 
talk about this when we think about things in terms of biblical prophecy. Ironically, one of the things we do take encouragement from, you know, our first point, sometimes we sit there and wonder about, man, I just wish I didn't know what was going to happen. I wish I could just be ignorant and just go on in bliss. But consider what would have happened if Daniel didn't have that understanding. Consider what would happen if God didn't give him the understanding we read about in Daniel 1, verse 17. What if he didn't have vision and understanding of dreams? Well, in a worst-case scenario, for Daniel, he would have died like everybody else. Now, if we didn't have the things that were revealed to us in the book of Daniel, you and I wouldn't understand the things that we understand today. Now, I do believe and understand that God may have chosen to reveal those in a different way so that maybe we would have them, but the things we know about the statue in Daniel 2, about the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the coming revival of the Roman Empire, that great stone cut without hands to destroy that. Without the book of Daniel, we wouldn't know that. Do you imagine not knowing those things? Again, I think, you know, God would have revealed it in another way. Amos 3, verse 7 reminds us that God doesn't do anything without revealing things through his prophets. But for Daniel on a personal level, you know, if he didn't know and understand the things that he did at that point in time, if he didn't have the faith to stand up and say something about it, he would have died along with all the rest. In the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we see a similar thing. They lived in a world where they did know and understand God. They lived in a world where God would provide for them. They knew that. What did they say? <laughs> they said, you know, King, whether God saves us or, uh, or not, please know that, you know, he's in charge and we're going to obey him no matter what. No, it took a tremendous amount of faith there. They put God to the test, and if they didn't have that faith in God, they surely would have died in that furnace, just like those guards did. In both cases, whether it's for Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they knew things. Instead of them being ignorant, God had given them understanding. He blessed them. He promoted them to prominence and wealth. And those are nice things to have. But you know, God could only do with them the things that he did because they did know what they knew. No, God can only do the things with him that he did because they did know what they knew. They didn't choose to be ignorant. Ignorance is not necessarily bliss. You know, there's something else beyond that. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2 and notice what's said about him interpreting the dream. Daniel 2, verse 46. We skipped over this and did that on purpose because I want to come back and touch on it here as we begin to conclude. Daniel 2, verse 46. After Daniel reveals the dream, verse 46, the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel. This is the king. The ruler of the known world at that time falls before Daniel. That's not the way it worked. Usually it's the other way around, right? It says, commanded that they should present an offering and an incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, and this is our memory verse this week, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Yeah, you know, Daniel's life was spared. He got a nice reward. That's great. But far more important things than that happened, a far more important thing than that happened. Because Daniel knew what he knew and acted on it, Nebuchadnezzar came to know who God was. And Nebuchadnezzar had his own problems and challenges later on, we know. But he knew God. He recognized who God was. And the story about the fiery furnace over in Daniel 3, Verse 28, Daniel 3, verse 28. This is after he said, look, you know, there's four in there, and the one looks like the Son of God. Verse 26, it says, uh, or excuse me, skipping on down to verse 28, it says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have tr- and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. They made they were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice because they put total faith in God. They put God to the test. Yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their house shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Again, Nebuchadnezzar realized there was no other God. He came to know and understand who God was. He glorified God because of their faith, because of their understanding, because of their actions. Nebuchadnezzar came to know God and others in his court did as well. Our third and final lesson then today is this. We live in a world where we can give others hope and encouragement by honoring and glorifying God. We live in a world where we can give others hope and encouragement by honoring and glorifying God. Daniel and friends lived in a world where people lacked understanding, and so they felt pressure on them to conform. But God blessed them, and he gave them the understanding, the tools, and the knowledge they needed. Daniel and friends lived in a world where they were persecuted for what they believed, to the point of death at times. But Daniel and friends put God to the test. God took care of them and provided their needs. Daniel and friends lived in a world where it seemed at times like a curse to know the things that they knew, where not knowing seemed like a safer, more comfortable option. But God used them, used their example and what they knew to bring honor and glory to his name. Through these three valuable lessons, May each of us truly feel and give great hope and encouragement.